Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Now what we're looking at are other components of moral decision making. So utilitarianism focuses a lot on consequences, but Bentham also talks about three other very important things, intentions, motives, and <coughs> dispositions. So intentions, what, what are our intentions? Um, you know, sometimes people will say things like, well, things didn't go according to my intentions or I had good intentions, but, but it backfired, yeah. Like the driving forces behind the actions. Okay, that's actually a bit more like uh, motives. So hold on to that thought, yeah. It's what you had like hope that your action would be there. Exactly, it was <laughs> what you had in mind, what you, when we say intend, it means what you're sort of like projecting out ahead, this is going to be the effect of my action. Somebody else had their, their hand up. Yeah. I was going to say it's like what was initially planned. Hmm. Very often intentions and plannings go, go hand in hand. And, you know, with a, a given action, Bentham points out, you might intend part of it, but you didn't intend all of it. You know, um, you intended the, the part that you did, but then you didn't happen to notice that the other person was coming down the hall at the same time. So shooting the Nerf gun down the hall, whack somebody in the eye and put out, you know, the proverbial eye. And uh, now it's a big problem, right? You say, well, I, I didn't intend to do that sort of thing. It just sort of happened that way. Um, in that case, the, the act has consequences that were unintended, right? Now, people can have intentions to do bad things. Um, people come along all the time and say, I'm going to mess you up. If they're saying something like that, they're saying, I have the intention of injuring you, right? That's what I'm going to mess you up. Uh, usually we substitute it in another word. That's what it means. That's that kind of intention, isn't it? Intentions are, for Bentham, always singular. They're always concrete. They're in the situation. So why are you here in this classroom? Because you have, you have the intention of showing up. And why aren't you sleeping right now you know, with your head on the desk? Because you have, you have the intention of paying attention. Um, and you're, in fact, doing that. It's leading to an action, right? Um, why am I talking about Bentham? Because I have the intention of communicating some of Bentham's moral theory to you in, in our class session. I plan to do that, so planning could be part of it. Um, if suddenly I spill you know, water on my laptop and I, I quickly I say, somebody go get, get paper towel. Um, I'm operating on an intention. I want to make sure that my laptop doesn't get destroyed. This is all fairly easy to, to grasp stuff, right? So you, you have a lot of experience with having intentions. And you can have more than one intention at a time. Right? You, can have, you can be of a split mind on something. You, you want to, uh, let's say you're invited to two different places by two different friends at the same time, and you like, equal, you like them equally, and you don't want to let them down. Um, you have the intention of going to both of them, but you can't actually act on the intention. Of both of them. You're, you're familiar with this sort of stuff. So now, motive, you talked about more things that drive us, right? Motives are something a bit deeper. These are something, if intentions are concrete in the individual circumstances or the situation, motives are something that you carry around with you and they're a bit more lasting. They're a bit more who you are. You know, you could, you could do something, you could intend some act, and that could be uncharacteristic for you. But your motives are 
as Bentham says, the pains and pleasures that you allow yourself to be affected by, to, to go into your decision making, to determine your choices uh, in a consistent way. So some people have different motivations than others. Some motivations we see as being good, some motivations we see as being bad. And, you know, if you think about when you were in English class and you had to do book reports or reports about, you know, characters and plays, and you had to talk about the person's motives, what's driving them? That's the question you ask. So what's a disposition? Um, not a term we use an awful lot, but you could say somebody's got a good disposition or a bad disposition, yeah. Um, is it what they think the end result will be? No, that's the that's again the intention. That's what they're aiming at. Yeah. Is it kind of like their demeanor, the way they conduct themselves, kind of? Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Um, Bentham doesn't use those terms because he's using a more Victorian language. Uh, we don't talk about disposition very much. He is of an indignant disposition, you know, characteristically. We we say that person has a good demeanor or a bad demeanor. Uh, attitude. Sometimes we talk in terms of somebody's a good attitude or a bad attitude. Um, what did you, what did you say? Disposition? The way you conduct yourself. Ah, yeah. So when you talk about the way you conduct yourself, you're talking about something that's present not just in one intention, act, consequence, one situation, but how you characteristically conduct yourself over time. How, what kind of a person you are. And these two are going to be more important for Bentham in terms of the, the nature of the, the, the individual person. Where we actually carry out moral evaluation, he says, is in terms of consequences and motives. Consequences of generating pleasure or pain. So, you know, he says over and over again things like, um, we want to evaluate, here we go, a man's intention can be styled good or bad with reference either to the consequences of the act or to, to his motives. If it's deemed good or bad in any sense, it must be because it's deemed to be productive of good or bad consequences. What makes good consequences good? They produce <coughs> pleasure and pain for more people. What makes bad consequences bad? They produce more pain than pleasure. So. If my intention is to harm you, that's a bad intention. Because if I actually am able to follow through on it, the consequence is just generating pain for you. If I happen to get my kicks out of that, that may introduce a little bit of pleasure. But you experiencing the pain outweighs the, the pleasure, most likely. Um, if my intention is to, here's a great example. So I've, I've got this, you know, knee brace because I tore two ligaments in my knee this summer. And technically speaking, I suppose I could get a handicap permit. Um, but why, why don't I have a handicap permit? Partly it's because of, you know, pride, because I want to feel like I'm handicapped. Um, but also because, you know, who really ought to get to use those spaces? I'm able to get around. I, I'm wearing a knee brace. And nowadays, just about anything can you know, qualify you for a handicap permit. Um, but I feel kind of bad because, you know, I, I can just imagine pulling up to that parking spot and getting out with my, my knee brace. Oh, yeah, I had a you know, crutch for a while, that would make sense. And I get out and I, you know, walk to the store, walk my 10 yards or whatever it is <coughs> to the store, and then I'll see somebody else with an oxygen tank and, you know, in a wheelchair, and they didn't get to park in the handicaps, the handicap space because I took it. Um, I'd feel pretty bad. If you were in that sort of situation, wouldn't you feel bad? You know, maybe you could get a handicap permit, but you probably shouldn't use it. Um, why would I feel bad? Well, because I would be leading, my intention of, of you know, using that, that permit would be leading to a situation that would generate more pain than pleasure. I'd not only feel bad and embarrassed, that person would have to like hoof it a while who doesn't really feel like doing that. Um, now, if I was a jerk, you know, let me get my handicap permit so I can like stick it to the, the old people, then I'd be taking pleasure in their pain, but it still probably would not be enough pleasure to out, outweigh their pain. Plus, you know, what if you saw me 
But let's say you saw this situation. Let's make it as, as, as uh, stark as possible. So we've got some 90-year-old lady who's in a wheelchair with an oxygen tank. What else should we give her to make her like super handicapped? Um, she had like one of those. She had a neck brace on too. And uh, what else can we add to the to the picture? What's that? <laughs> She has a bad leg, yes. So even if she gets out of the wheelchair, she's going to have trouble. Um, well, let's give her a one eye pirate patch. This is getting a little frivolous, but. Um, <coughs> then you see me walking along, and let's say I don't even have the knee brace on. You see me get out of the car and walk those, you know, 10, 10 yards, and now you see this other lady, like, circling around the parking lot, finally finding a spot. And she has to like hobble her way. It takes her five minutes to get across the blazing hot parking lot. Would you be kind of ticked off? Would you feel a sense of indignance? Look at that guy. <clears throat> what a jerk. <clears throat> well, that would be you feeling pain. Would you feel sorry for the old lady? That would also be you feeling pain on her part. So I would be creating a situation that would have a greater balance of pain over pleasure. You can have bad intentions. And you can also have good intentions, you know. I uh, help the old lady across the street. Good act. She doesn't get hit by a car, you know. Nobody feels bad, everybody feels good. Um, so what about motives? How can we evaluate those? Um, sounds like motives are something different that we could uh, evaluate on their own basis, and we'll look at some ways to do that. But really what it comes down to, certain motives are going to lead characteristically to outcomes. Another way of talking about consequences is outcomes. <coughs> outcomes that are more pleasurable, others are going to lead to outcomes that are more painful. Here we go, he says, um, if any sort of motive can, in consideration of its effects, be termed with propriety a bad one, it can only be with reference to the balance of all the effects. It may have had of both kinds in a given period that is of its usual tendency. So people who like hurting other people, sadists, that, that, that is a motive. That's part of the motive that Bentham would call malevolence. Um, do they tend to produce situations, tend to produce outcomes that are more painful than pleasurable for most of the people involved? Yeah, so that's a bad motive. What about people who tend to volunteer their time, their energy for causes that alleviate suffering? Generally create more pleasure than pain? Even if it means like they're not hanging out with their friends so their friends are a little bit ticked or you know, not showing up for a family event. But they are serving at the soup kitchen or in the free clinic or, you know, even make, perhaps we could say, you know, some political things might be that way. Engaging in activism for the greater good. That would be a good motive in general. What about dispositions? Well, we evaluate them in the same way, too, in terms of consequences. Do the, does the disposition tend to, on the whole, produce actions which lead to a greater balance of pleasure over pain than their good dispositions? Do they tend to lead instead to um, balance of pain over pleasure? Then they're bad. This is pretty, pretty straightforward, isn't it? For Bentham. So that's how we evaluate these sort of character traits, the things that make us who we are, that, that give us our basic drives, our basic uh, patterns of behavior and, and motivation. Um, now notice he says something else that's really interesting about this. He's got a lot of examples in here. When it comes to a lot of different motives, that is the tendency to be influenced by some pleasures or pains, um, we describe them differently in different situations. Sometimes we see them as good, sometimes we see them as bad. He gives you a whole bunch of great examples. Um, let me just mention a few of these. Uh, so for pleasures of, of uh, sense, he says, uh, in very typically Victorian language, 
A boy who does not want for victuals steals a cake out of a pastry cook shop and eats it. In this case, his motive will be universally deemed a bad one. You know, if you ask what it is, it may be answered perhaps licorishness. Now, I've never heard of <coughs> anyone calling anybody licorice in my life, but what does that mean? The kid just likes to eat stuff. He likes, he likes the taste of things, and he steals a, a cake. Um, what's his motive? To gratify his senses. That's a bad motive in this case because the, you know, what happens? The shop owner's ticked. He's mad because the cake has been stolen. The kid got some pleasure out of eating the cake, but the shop owner's mad, and whoever else wanted to eat that cake is put out as well. So it's, it's a bad motive. A boy buys a cake out of the pastry cook shop and eats it. In this case, his motive can be, scarcely be looked upon as good or bad. Unless his master be out of humor with him, then perhaps he may call it licorishness as before. Um, here we have a sort of neutral thing. Go ahead and buy yourself. We, let's substitute candy instead of cake. Kid goes into a shop. What's, what's a candy you guys like? In particular? Halloween's coming up. What's, what's your favorite candy? Reese's Pieces? Those are pretty good. Everybody likes Reese's Pieces except anyone with a peanut allergy. Um, probably don't like it then. It kills you. But, um, so a kid goes in the shop, right? He has a hankering for Reese's Pieces, stuffs it in his pocket, walks out. That's, that was a bad act. That was a bad moment. In general, um, kid goes and buys it. He's motivated by the same thing, wanting Reese's Pieces, wanting something sweet to, to, to eat. But now it's an okay motive. What made it good or bad? The consequences that it led to. So the same thing could be good or bad, depending on the tendency of the consequences. He talks about um, the pleasures of the sexual sense. Uh, in, a, in a neutral sense, may be termed sexual desire. Um, neither good nor bad, right? And everybody has some degree of sexual desire. If you don't, then your, your, hor your hormone balances are like totally off. And you better get that checked, because that's not normal. Um, if it leads to, he says, um, in a bad sense, it's spoken under the, the name of lasciviousness and a variety of other names of reprobation. We talk about lust for example. And then he says, a man ravishes a virgin. In this case, the motive is without scruple, termed by the name of lust and so forth, and universally looked at as a bad one. So if you, because of sexual desire, you force yourself on somebody else, bad consequences, creating more pain than, than pleasure, <coughs> right? So it's a bad motive. On the other hand, he says, the same man at another time exercises the rights of marriage with his wife. In this case, the motive is accounted perhaps a good one, or at least indifferent. Um, I think, in general, in our society, we're a little bit more, uh, uh, what would you call it? We recognize that this is a good motive. You know, the intimacy that comes with, with uh, relationships, that sort of thing. Um, it's the same motive, wanting to have sex. It's the same desire for the same kind of pleasure. But it's, as it goes through this chain, it, the consequences are different, aren't they? And that's what makes it good or bad. He has just a ton of different examples like this. Um, we don't necessarily need to, to look at too many of them. Um, but let's, let's talk about one, though, that, that's particularly important in our own culture. Wealth. We do have a desire for wealth. Did, did any of you want to be poor? You have a desire for that? Do you have a desire to, to have money? Not necessarily to be, you know, like stinking rich Uncle Scrooge jumping into piles of coins and dollar bills. That would, wouldn't be good for you anyway. It would hurt like hell to jump into a pile of coins. Um, can you imagine doing that? That would be kind of funny, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would be what it would be like. You'd get out with bruises, coin imprints on your face. But, you know, we, we do want wealth. You know that money's good for stuff. Now, that desire for wealth, that can be a very strong motive. People kill each other for that sort of thing, at least in you know, movies, actually, they're doing in real life as well. Um, he says, to the pleasures of wealth corresponds a sort of motive which in a neutral sense may be termed pecuniary interest, being interested in, in you know, making money. In a bad sense, what do we call the desire for wealth? When we don't like somebody's desire for wealth, what do we call it? He says, avarice. Do you, do you talk about anyone being avaricious? Greed. 
Greed. Greed, exactly, yeah. And generally we look at greed as a bad motive, don't we? Somebody is greedy, they want more than their fair share, they're always talking about what they can get out of things. Um, he also talks about covetousness. That would be more for um, property or things that other people have. Rapacity, lucre, filthy lucre. Um, being cheap, being stingy, those are all bad ways of talking about that motive of wanting the pleasure of money. What about in a good sense? Somebody desires money, they do it in such a way that leads to good consequences. They do, in fact, get their hands on money. What do we call that kind of person? Do we have good names, good ways of talking about that? Frugal, they're, they're a frugal person. Uh, that's usually like having to do with the not spending too much on things. Um, do we talk about people like finding good sources of income in a positive way? We have the term hustler to, to hustle, but that has some negative connotations. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneurial. Yeah, okay, entrepreneurial uh, as, a, as an adjective. The entre you know, somebody's entrepreneurial. Wow, that's a long word. Um, <coughs> that's, a, that's a positive term, usually. Yeah. Thrifty. Thrifty, yeah. Uh, that works. I think that one has to do more with like conserving what you've got, right? Making everything count. Do we have any other terms? Frugal. Frugal, yeah. I use that one. So you notice the same thing. The, the same motive can be used over and over again in positive or negative ways. It depends entirely on, on what the concept.